Good morning, Facebook. We will be starting in about seven minutes our Bible study. Morning, Needy. Good to have you with us, B. Morning, Pat. Morning, Dara. For making the sun to shine, putting the stars in the sky, for the flowers that bloom, the ocean so blue. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the sparrow that sings. It makes sweet melody for the rivers that flow, the rain and the snow. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you, Lord, for everything Morning, Doris. you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. 
I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, for my whole family, for the joys you've given me, for the shoes on our feet, plenty to eat. Thank you, Lord. Thank we'll be starting here in about three minutes. Our Bible study. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for everything you've done. Morning, Michael. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being a friend so dear, giving my sad heart cheer, for holding my hand when I could not stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life for me. On a cross hey, of Calvary. Hey, Bob. Hi, Danny. Hey, Danny. Thank you, Lord. He must still be laying in bed. You've done for me. There he is. There you go. <laughs> there you are, Danny. I thought you were dead for something. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Lord. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Jason Thompson is on. Who's on? Jason Thompson. Oh, very good. Hey, Jason. Good to see you. Who's on? Good morning. How's the uh, How's the Zoom look this I morning? I was wide awake this morning. Oh yeah. You had your first cup of coffee? Oh, I've had two cups of coffee, I think. Oh, you ought to be really rare. And, and, then, I, and then I've got this right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good size. Oh, you ought to be really rare. That's right. <laughs> Hey, I'm going to miss it in the morning. I've got a 9 o'clock appointment. Oh, I'm oh. sorry to hear that. Uh, I hate, hated to miss it last night, and I hate it tomorrow, but can't hardly help it. Yeah. Well, as I said, if you ever want to, uh, to be in a private Zoom room at some time and, and watch any of these, you let me know. Because they're on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> they're on Facebook, and we could show it to you again. Well, I've got Facebook, but I've never used it for this. <laughs> Oh, hey, Albert, we also have Lori McGowan. Oh, good. Iowa. Hey, morning, Lori. And there's also Gail and Idell. Nice to see you all. Good to have you here. Must just be and showing up on your Facebook page. Lori is. but It's 930. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What a taskmaster. Man, oh, man. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity again to look into your word. Father, what a wonderful way to start the day, to be able to, to get into your word, to fellowship in this way. Father, we know that we, we need to be in the world speaking to people about things that involve our daily lives in this world, but to be able to come together and focus directly on your word and therefore to use the things we learn to affect our lives when we are in the world, talking to people about things necessary for our living in this world, that we are able to do so, Father, as Christ would do if he was in our place. Help us, Father, to learn from your truth and to realize exactly how you would have us, Father, to, to live and to talk, to act and to worship. Father, we are so blessed in many ways, but the blessing of having your truth that can show us your way, Father, is, is 
a blessing beyond imagination. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. You know, we've, uh, oh, morning, Uncle Ross. Morning, Donnie. My, my eyes are... <laughs> I have a hard time seeing the text on my Facebook page. I've got my, my screen all the way over there. And so please, if I mispronounce someone's name that I should be should most certainly know your name, uh, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> we are in Psalm 119. And we've only done our first study in Psalm 119, but already I am noticing in my own my own way of thinking, my own my own way of of uh, of uh, thinking about God's word. I guess I should say, uh, a recognition of something I already knew deep down, but it, it's something that I think it, we need to incorporate into our lives more than just knowing it deep down, and that is the blessing of having God's Word. That, that's what Psalm 119 is, one of the main points, let me say it that way, of what Psalm 119 is saying. The, the psalmist is so happy, so joyful, so intent on the fact that God's word is his, God's word is a blessing, it is able to help him to be more godly. I don't know that he ever uses the word godly in the godly in the entire uh, in the entire uh, psalm, but that is his point. That is what he's working towards. The fact that he he knows what righteousness is, and therefore he is able to live in a righteous way because God has given us His Word. And he and I I believe Bob mentioned this yesterday in our in our study in our study of, of Psalm one nineteen. And it's the fact that he is joyful about it, and he wants to praise God's Word. He wants to he wants to say praises about the fact that he is able to to do that. Now, uh, speaking of Bob, Bob gave me some letters. Morning, Jeff. Bob gave me some letters, um, some verses that, that we're going to be covering today. He went over and saw some verses that he thought was really good, and I decided we, let's go ahead and do those. Um, we're going to be in verses 89 through 96. Um, 89 through 96. Uh, there are a couple of different um truths there i mean it's all truth obviously but what i mean is there's a couple of major truths that affect our our understanding of some doctrines today that are in these verses that we're going to be covering um the, and obviously there's other things for us to note about uh, about thinking about god's word but I, but i i'm very excited about being able to point those out this morning, so let's read through the entire psalm. The entire, it's not entire psalm. Let's read through his entire eight verses, and then we're going to go back and cover them. Verse eighty-nine, Psalm one nineteen. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth, and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Okay, now, several things for us to note in there. But let's, let's start right there in verse 89. Um, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heaven. Uh, now, notice what this is showing us uh, about God's nature as far as truth. Uh, is God fickle, does this verse say, or is God solid on what is truth? Solid. Very solid. There is no, you know, there's a lot of people who seem to think on Judgment Day God's going to change his mind. He's going to do things differently than he said he was going to do. 
There's a lot of people who would like God to change his mind on certain, on certain commandments or certain, uh, or, or certain identifications of what sin are. But this verse makes it clear. God's word is settled. It's a settled matter. It's not something to be, to be, uh, uh, to be argued against and to be able to win an argument with God and say, okay, let's go ahead and change that. No, God's word is settled. This is That's the way Jesus it is. what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35. Okay, go ahead. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Yeah, yeah. I remember that in Matthew 5. Isn't that Matthew 5, uh, verse, uh, is that also in chapter 24? 24, 35, 24, yes. 35. Okay, two different times that Jesus says that. In fact, I'm wanting in a few moments I want to look at Matthew five, where it says the same thing, because it's interesting what he is combining that with. So in a few moments we're going to look at it in chapter five, verse uh, nineteen. We're going to be looking at it there. But uh, so hold hold that thought for the moment. But yeah, you know, uh, God's word is so solid that basically he's saying heaven and earth could pass away first before my word will pass away. Well, there's a reason that he's saying it that way. And we're going to see that here in this psalm. So, well, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> we're right there, verse 90. Look, verse, look at verse 90 and 91 together. Your faithfulness con continues throughout all, throughout all generations. You establish the earth, and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. Now notice, he says your faithfulness continues. Now that is, that is upon what he just said. Your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues. You, will, you, you, are, you are locked into, I hate to say it that way, as if God, is, God doesn't have any choices. I don't mean it that way. You and you and the word are together and will continue. You will be faithful in what you said you're going to do. This is the way it is. It doesn't change. It's settled, as he says in verse 1. Okay, so God's going to be faithful about that. It's going to continue throughout all generations. His word, his decision will not change. Now, then he said, you establish the heaven and and the earth, the heavens, I'm sorry, you establish the earth and it stands. Now, look at the word they in 91. The word they is speaking of the earth and God's faithfulness to keep what he says he's going to do. Those two things together. They both stand this day according to to your ordinances. All right? So, God has determined how long the earth is going to be here. God has determined how long his word is settled. Well, his word is settled for all generations. And he established the earth and it stands. Go to the verses I said a few moments ago. Go to Matthew. Hold your hand right here. And go with me to Matthew chapter 5. And notice how Jesus applies the exact same, the exact same uh, truth together about that the fact that the earth is solid and God's word is solid. Okay, verse nineteen. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, I'm sorry, I'm going to start at verse eighteen. My mistake. Go to verse eighteen first. Yeah, that's what I want anyway. Verse 18. I don't want 19. But let's do 17 and 18. Sorry. That's, I, I know what I'm doing now. Look at this. 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. There we go. Finally got it out right. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, well, that kind of proves that the law and the prophets are going to be around as long as the earth is around. Now, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the same thing he's saying back here in verse 90 and 91 of Psalm 119. Look at what he's saying. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away. Uh, I'm sorry. 
Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one smallest letter or stroke shall pass away until all is accomplished. Now the law and the prophets, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, were to bring us to Christ. All right? So they accomplished what they were sent for, given for. Jesus Christ on the cross says, it is finished. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 3, the Ephesians, Colossians chapter 2, he says that the law was nailed to the cross. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says it was taken away so that both Jew and Gentile have access to God. All right? So the law fulfilled, the law and the prophets fulfilled what they were given for, to bring us to the point of Christ. Once Christ came on the earth, accomplished his mission, it was, it was the law and the prophets were finished because they had fulfilled what they were given for. And now we have the new covenant. But he modifies it by saying, it's more likely that the earth and heavens will pass away than my law will pass away. Or just as likely. Go back to go back to Psalm 119, verse 90 and 91 again. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances. The earth stands today according to God's ordinances. He has set a time when it will be destroyed. Okay? His law, his heaven, I mean, I'm sorry, his word, his faithfulness to his word continues throughout all generations. It stands according to his ordinances, just like he said that he is going to be faithful. Okay? Did I hear you start to say something a moment ago, Bob? Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Oh. Are, you, are you able to, are you receiving the Zoom working like it should? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah there's no lag today. Okay, good deal. I think I found out what that was yesterday. My computer needed to do some updates. And I don't, okay. know if you, I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but when a computer needs to do updates, it's almost like they put it in there to mess with you. Until you do those updates, it's not going to work efficiently. Okay? And so I, I come to find out what that was. Because it worked just, my laptop worked just fine yesterday evening for Bible class. So that's what it was there. Okay. You know, Paul, uh, Paul emphasized too in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God is faithful. And so it's, it's continually mentioned that God is always doing that which he said he would do. Amen. Yes, he will. Um, uh, it, God has a, I like to always point it out, God God is batting a thousand on what he says he will do. Batting a thousand. He, he mm -hmm. always has accomplished what he says he will do within the parameters of what, of, of, of what he says. For instance, he told Israel that they would that, that the promised land would be theirs for all generations, forever, as long as they were faithful to him. Okay? So he, he sometimes has little stipulations in there. They have to keep their part of the covenant, or else he is not going to to keep to to do something. You know, that's part of a that's part of an agreement we have today. I went to uh I, I went to sell a house one time and someone put money up for the house. Okay, they call that earnest money. And that earnest money would be applied towards the payment of the house unless they defaulted and decided they weren't going to buy the house. And then I get the earnest money anyway. They don't get it back. And they don't get the house either. Okay, that actually happened. <laughs> they decided not to buy the house. So the earnest money was mine. Okay, so, so we have that in contracts all the time. God does that as well. I will be your God as long as you are my people. You decide you want to be my people. So yeah, God is faithful. Good force to I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I think it's good for us to look at the negative side of God being uh, faithful to do what he said. He has promised the eternal life for those who are faithful, mm -hmm. but he's promised eternal damnation for those who are not. Amen. He Let, keeps his promises. Yeah. Let's look at it the opposite way as well. When God says he's going to destroy someone, we, God has always allowed repentance to be there. And so God, that's one little thing that God has in there. But if you repent, I will not. I will relent. Okay? That happened to Nineveh. God sent God sent uh, Jonah to Nineveh to say, God's going to be destroying you. They repented. 
and God relented from what he was going to do. Repentance has always been something. That's not God changing changing who he is. That's not God, God being unfaithful to his word. That is a stipulation that God has always made. If you repent, as long as you have breath to breathe, okay, if you, if you repent and you do what's necessary towards that repentance, towards that change, God will not do what he's threatening to do. Okay, so that that is not a God changing himself. That is not God changing his law. That is that is right written down in God's law, in who God is. Repentance is something that God requires, without or else there will be punishment. Okay. Now the latter part of ninety one. I don't want to miss that. Uh, so so his faithfulness to his word and his the earth stands according to his his ordinances. Then it says, for all things are your servants. Now, the earth is God's creation. It is his servant. Everything God has created belongs to him. His word is his servant. Um, in, in the Old Testament, I can't, uh, where is it? It's in Isaiah, that God's word will not come back void. It will do exactly what he says it will. Is that Isaiah 55? I believe, but his word will not come back to him void. It will accomplish what he set it out to do. It's his servant. Okay. Um, verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. Now here's one of those things that David is, the psalmist, is praiseworthy about God's, word, God's law. It has kept it has gotten him out of trouble. It has kept him from getting into trouble. I oftentimes will joke when someone says how busy they are, and I, I'll make a joke and say, well, it, it just keeps you out of trouble. That's all it does, you know, and, and joking totally. But God's law can literally do that. Following God's will, following God's way of doing things can literally do that. You can see that in various ways. One of the common, most common ways we point out is that, for instance, drunkenness is a sin. Getting drunk all the time, getting drunk at all, is a sin. Well, someone who gets drunk all the time is in danger of damaging their liver. Now, God didn't say drunkenness is a sin because it's going to damage your liver. Drunkenness is a sin because it is, it is against God's God's will, it's against what God has created us towards, it's against how, how we, are, we are made to be. But notice, notice what, what David says here. Um, you, if your law had not been in my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. You can literally perish by not being willing and happy to keep God's law. It can be damaging to your body. Okay. You know, he's, he's emphasized this in more than one time. The first psalm we covered mm -hmm. in Psalms 1, my delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the 11th verse of this chapter, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Yeah. So he continually emphasizes, get this in your, in your, in your minds, in your hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know what? And, and to continue with what I was, I was mentioning, because yeah, Bob's absolutely right. You need to have this in you. Um, I, I challenge you to look at various sins of the Bible and try to notice a ramification outside of the Bible in our lives that can happen to us. Mm -hmm. Sexual promiscuity. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of sexual diseases out there, aren't there? I mean, you can sit there and note various things in God's Word that isn't it just lucky that it just happens to be something that keeps us from getting into other problems in our lives outside of God's word. Isn't that just lucky? Boy, mm -hmm. how did God do that? You know, or, or, or I guess God, no, no. God recognizes how we are created to be. And his laws are there for his reasons, but they also happen to be a good idea for other reasons, okay? <clears throat> That's the reason too. He tells us our bodies are not our own. In in Corinthians, that uh, so many people, and you see it constantly, smoking damages your lungs. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's lots these, of things. These things God knew before man ever discovered it. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that we can do in this earth that can be damaging to us that are sins and that aren't sins. That's, that's exactly right. Um, go to verse 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Now notice once again, a lot of times people look at God's word in the negative way. Look at what God keeps me from doing. But the psalmist looks at it in the positive way. Again, like he just did in verse 92, he says in verse 93. Not only does, in verse 92, not only does the law keep him from getting into trouble, okay, brought him out of trouble. In verse 93, your precepts, just another word for the same thing he's talking about in verse 92, your precepts have revived me, okay? Um, um, Peter says something very similar in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, those who are not growing in, in Christ, well, let me, let me read it the way he says it. In 2 Peter chapter 1, look at what he says. There. You know, now, but that reminds me too of what, what Jesus said, that he, I am life. And in John, uh, John 1, 14, Jesus was the life. That's right, exactly. And so, and, and, and his word is what, as he's saying there, it revives us. But, but look, at, look at what he says. The idea he's saying, he's saying, I will never forget your precepts, for they, as Bob is saying, have given me life through Christ, all right, for, for us today. But he also says this about not forgetting, or the people who do forget. Um, verse 9 of Second Peter chapter 1, For he who lacks these qualities is blind, or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So when we are not growing in Christ the way we should, we're basically we're basically not doing what the psalmist says. He says, I'll never forget your precepts. They're what saved me. They're what revived me. When we're, when we're neglecting our growth as a Christian, we are forgetting the fact of where this has brought us out the, the God's God's way has brought us out of sin and so and so that concept is continual uh, in God's word uh, verse 94 I am yours save me for I have sought your precepts okay this is this is much like the promise that Jesus Christ makes in John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32 you abide in my word um, you'll be my disciples and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, belonging to Christ, being his disciples, his truth will set us free. Uh, verse 94, I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. This is a promise of God all the way through the Bible. Seek my way and I will save you. And of course it includes the idea of seeking, it includes the idea of following that way. Towards God, Look at this verse, bears the thought of continuing to follow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not just not just a one time I'm saved, but staying right. with Him. Exactly. Exactly. Verse ninety five. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. Now, most people, when something like that's happening, they're thinking of self. They're thinking of, okay, God, save me. All right. Notice that the psalmist doesn't say this. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently discover or consider your testimonies. Okay? That doesn't lose his focus on doing God's will. There is no time out. Okay, time out for being a Christian. You have to worry about the fact that wicked people are trying to destroy you. Or time out from being a Christian. You have to worry about this serious disease that you have. Time out from being a Christian. You have to worry about this loved one of yours that's going through a tough time. Time out. No, there is no time out. There is no, there is no stopping and following God. Um, uh, is it John Lennon who had a song that said, life is something that happens when you're busy doing other things? Right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was meaning it towards a different thing, a diff different way. But but in verse ninety five, that's what that's what life is. Life is just something that happens while I'm busy considering God's word. Okay, 
We, they, the, the psalmist is not going to change from his attitude towards God's word because bad people are trying to do things to him right now. What would God have me do in this situation? What would God have me be doing instead of focusing on this situation? What, is, what would God want me to do? Okay. We, don't, we don't tend to think that way. Well, you've got to understand, this is going on in his life right now, so he can't be obedient to God. That doesn't compute with the psalmist, okay? The, the one inspired by God's word. Ten minutes? Okay, I see you. <laughs> I got the ten-minute warning. That's okay, we're, we're down to the last verse. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Paul, Paul points this out, too, in two places. In, in uh, or Peter, rather, Peter and Paul, that the wicked uh, wish to destroy you. Peter says he's as, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. And in Corinthians, or Ephesians, rather, when Paul was talking about uh, put on the whole armor of God, he said, we fight against that which is actually the king of the, the king or the ruler of the earth. It's, we're, we're fighting high places. Yeah. So this, they're always waiting. Someone's always, yeah. it's always Satan behind it all, but always waiting somewhere to try to get us off track. Right, and, and that's the purpose of him waiting to get to us, of trying to right. get to us. And his servants, and those who are not meaning to be his servants uh, on this earth, or are meaning to be his servants on this earth. But that's, that's the purpose, is to try and get us, if you want to use a sports analogy, analogy, trying to get us off our game. All right, trying to get us away from our walk with Christ. And that that was a reason too for him for him pointing out in Romans chapter one that uh, we we are the servants of one to whom we obey, whether of obedience unto righteousness or unto death. Either way, right, right. Well, you know, quite frankly, Satan has no no uh, ability to win. He his only way he's going he's losing in the end, but his only way. His only power over us is to get us to either give up or, you know, well, same idea, is to get, get us to ignore what we're supposed to be doing or give up, quit, okay? That's his only power. He yeah. cannot take us out of God's love, but we can leave He has God's no love. power over us other than what we give him. Exactly, exactly. Finally, verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection. <clears throat> Your commandment is ex exceedingly broad. Now again, don't get caught up in that word perfection like we have it within our English language. This is not saying, I have seen a limit to all sinlessness. That's how we normally think of the word perfection. The Bible never, ever uses the word perfect or perfection to speak of sinlessness i challenge you to show me a place where that word does and then i'll and then i'll change my statement and and say except one place where you show me but I, right now i'm good i i know of no place in the bible where it ever speaks of sinlessness lack of sin perfection the word here this idea is maturity completeness okay it seems within the in, within the context of what he's saying here um He's talking about much like what the book of Ecclesiastes is speaking of. The book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon goes through and says, I've tried it all. And I've seen the most important thing is, is to fear God and keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Okay, that's what's most important. Not, not anything else. Well, seems like the psalmist is saying the same thing here. I've seen a limit to all perfection, to all to all, all mature completeness, to all things in this earth. There's a limit to it. It can only go so far. It can only do so much. But your commandment is exceedingly broad. God's word covers every circumstance that we can ever be in. When Jesus, when, when Paul says in, in um, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Do all by his authority. We can go to God's word and see what is authorized by him. We can see what God wants us to be doing. 
And we need to be within God's authority. It covers it all. It's very broad. But everything in this world has its limitations. Okay. Any other comments on those verses? Now see, I, I made it through even getting the 10 minute warning. We got into the five minute warning yet? I can't hear you. You're off. It doesn't, it doesn't give me a five minute warning. Oh, I'm just guessing you. that you have like three and a half minutes okay. left well, based that's on okay. my timer. That's okay. We're, we're just going to go ahead and have our prayer and we'll be finished. Okay. Uh, don't forget, though, just an announcement. Don't forget at one o'clock today is the uh, graveside for Daryl Myers. So keep, keep, the, keep that family in your prayers. And, uh, and if you're able to be there, great. If not, it's going to be kind of a rainy, a rainy one. It looks like, but we're going to be under, we're going to be under a cover of a, of a uh, canopy. So uh, if you're able to come, that's great. Let's go to God. Albert, one final, one final yeah. thought with with this very last sentence in this mm -hmm. in this part of the psalm, anyway, that exceedingly broad indicates uh, no end. Yeah. In this, it's the idea, and it's exactly what Peter said in Second Peter one three. It's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to God in a word of prayer and we'll be closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to see your word. And Father, please help us to be delight in what your word is saying. To recognize, Father, that it's through your word that we can become what you want us to be. Help us, Father, to focus on that. And help us, Father, to lean upon your favor, on the power of your son's sacrifice as being what is able to cover our sins. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen.